I realize if I noise cancel that now, it'll remove all mentions of Hamilton from the pod. It's just like American history. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thanks. Hello and welcome to episode 231 of The Crate and Crowbar. It is the 23rd of March, 2018. My name is Chris Thurston and joining me from the other side of the room, it's Philippa War. Alexander Hamilton! We went to see Hamilton last week <laughs> and Pip will continue to sing songs that she remembers being in Hamilton probably for the rest of the podcast. I don't remember them accurately. <laughs> it's probably important to But stress. you did enjoy it. I had a great time. Yeah. <laughs> You should stress that it's not a judgment on the show that you can't remember any of the songs. No. <laughs> and in that sense, we should queue for tickets because, well, I was going to say, by the time we finally got to see it again in 18 months or whatever, um, you'd have forgotten them, but it's only been a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but tone and key and things are, are the first to go, aren't they? <laughs> are they? Well, I mean, they never really happen for me. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty optional, <laughs> I would say. So I just sort of slot the names into songs I do remember. So, you know, <laughs> and even then, <laughs> it's a bit hit and miss, is it not? It is. Um, <laughs> I was going to, uh, yes, no, there was no Hamilton joke there. I was fishing for one, but there just wasn't one. No. And anyway, I wouldn't want to spoil anything about Hamilton for some people who haven't seen it, because I managed to go in completely unspoiled of anything about it, and it was amazing. So did I. And do you re- manage to return to that state, which is <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> Yes, it's a Chris and Pip pod this week, and also a very late recording Chris and Pip pod. We never a pod, pod, because we never normally record on a Friday. But uh, both of these things are a consequence of uh, a kind of uh, the partly the mass GDC exodus. GDC is on right now, or it's on its final day right now, uh, where which is where Tom Francis is doing talks, meeting friends. Marsh is also there, I believe. Uh, the mythological creature formerly known as Marsh. Do they need to know this? I, <laughs> uh, what does Marsh do for the podcast now, really? Well, you know, people might just want to know where he is at oh. any given time. Maybe they should take some comfort knowing he's in Sweden. If he is moved, then maybe it's a good idea to kind of just should let people tag know. Him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yes, you know, like a phone or something. A GPS. Yeah. Um, and I'm just explaining why it's just you <laughs> and I. Pip. positional service. <laughs> Nice. Thanks. But there's been, uh, there's been some, some internet computer games news. If you'd like to m- move straight on to the, the, the meaty business of this podcast, Pip, then well, we can do that. I, um, haven't really thought any of this through. So what's the news? <laughs> well, one bit of non-GDC related news that did tickle me a little bit is, uh, so a couple of weeks ago, a company announced that they were working on, uh, remasters of the first three Tomb Raider games that would be released on Steam and they would be free to people who own those original games. So the Which ver- first three? The first uh, one, first two, and three. three. Yeah, like okay. the, the very original Tomb Raider games. Mm. Um, and then <laughs> this week it just came out, that's not happening. Um, because they don't have the rights to that. And Square Enix basically went, no, you're not. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't say you could do that. And this company's gone like, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? They just announced that they were doing this. Presumably, I mean, to be honest, like, I am not being a particularly competent newsman here because I don't have the exact details, but maybe they just thought that, like, like a, like a, like a Project Gutenberg piece of classic literature that it was just like, us oh, from the 90s. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's fr- the original it's public domain now. <laughs> yeah, the original rights holders are all long dead. <laughs> um, maybe they're like me just saying they'll do things and assuming <laughs> that it'll probably happen. <laughs> yeah. That to-do list is just, you know, I assume if I write it down, it'll happen. Someone will do it. I think they've said something like they're no longer focusing on third-party uh, projects. And it's like, well, <laughs> nobody asked you, apparently. <laughs> maybe maybe there's another story there. Maybe I'm painting them in the wrong light. Maybe they did they did have the license and all they thought they did and Square Enix are being weird. But it's it's such a strange thing to happen or to try and pull, if that is what's happened, on like the week the Tomb Raider movie comes out. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's, suddenly they're going to be quite protective of that name for a while, probably always are, but you know what I mean? Well, I mean, maybe that was a key marketing point is that when the movie comes out, that's a great time to, <laughs> to get announce. people interested <laughs> in Tomb Raider again. Yeah. Um, 
It's a key tentpole event, Chris. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, that's that's why they got that new um, Pacific Rim movie out so fast to make sure they can capitalize off Into the Breach, you know. Oh, I thought you meant off, off Tomb Raider. I oh, no. I'm really not following at this point. <laughs> or maybe, like, there was some hot new Mariana Trench n- news or something, you know. <laughs> James Cameron's come back out of it. <laughs> <laughs> was he in the trench? I think he's still down there. Is this a Titanic reference? No, no, no. He genuinely went down there in a pod, I think. This is, cut, it's really deep. It, yeah, that's why he went there and not like, I, I don't know. I thought he could only send robots down past a certain depth. Well, is pres- James Cameron a robot? He could be. He could be a Terminator. I don't know. I think... Uh, is so, a Terminator a robot? Yes. Are they not just future bodybuilders? No, that they wear the skin of present day bodybuilders. It's really easy to make that mistake. Hang on. So are they made of metal? Yes. And skin? Well, they have like a, a covering. Like a carapace? Like, yeah, like a, like a kind of fake body. So, so they look human. Apart from the, the, the liquid metal one from Terminator 2. But which he, he looked can, human. He can transform. He's like a, tra- um, uh, not like a transformer. They turn into cars. <laughs> um, and they're also robots. Right. Uh, no, it's like a machine that can pretend to be human. Why? Uh, in order to infiltrate and kill people. But surely it would be better to pretend to be a computer. Why? Because th- they're in lots of places. <laughs> they don't run around, though, firing shotguns. But why would you want to? To kill people. But, okay, so if that's the point, why not just be a computer that they use and then you electrocute them? That's a good idea, yeah. Cool. I think you've... Yes, I mean, that would have been much more effective. It would have been less exciting action film. <laughs> <laughs> when, like, I don't know, like, the first more one has efficient. to... First one has to assassinate, like, you know, the first one has to assassinate Sarah Connor, the second one has to assassinate young... Why, what was she up to? Uh, she was going to give birth to John Connor, eventually. Right. Because they come from... The, uh, so what not, was John Connor? He will eventually become a, a vital part of the human resistance against the robots in the future. Is he from Die Hard? No. That's John McClane. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we should stress, Pip has never seen an 80s action movie. No. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, I don't... Like, uh, what I mean, were we to talking be fair, about? even if I had... <laughs> By now. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Have you seen Jurassic has... Park? That was dinosaurs. That oh, was dinosaurs. Thanks. We went to see Jurassic World in the cinema. I'm fairly sure that happened. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm <laughs> fairly sure I've seen Jurassic Park too. But, and the, I think that there was an ape, but I think that might have been Dudley checks in. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure. <laughs> Were there apes in Jurassic Park? Too? I don't think so. Because I'm fairly sure I went to see both of those films at the cinema, but I don't know how much has Are been Are you sure completed. one of them wasn't King Kong? I've never seen King Kong. Okay. I wouldn't know him if I met him. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might. <laughs> like, that's an 80... Dudley! 80 foot gorilla. <laughs> I am much bigger in real life. Which ones? Gorillas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they could have made him a Terminator. That would have been an equally confounding disguise. Yeah, but at least he could have, like, trodden on stuff. That's what King Kong did, didn't it? A, a mixture of treading and throwing. Okay, cool. Yeah, you'd relate. <laughs> <laughs> um, l- yes, so that's the Tomb Raider news. <laughs> <laughs> and a brief synopsis of Terminator 2. Cool. Um, what Spoilers. else? Oh, uh, I think Jalopy is out next week. They announced that. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, have you played Jalopy? I have. Jalopy is... Uh, game. I tried to steal those sausages, remember? You did, yeah. Yeah. And in the game, <laughs> um, Jalopy is the uh, uh, sort of, uh, would you say story driven indie game or just a sort of like it's, experiential well, kind of thing? I, mm, not the way I played it, but, uh, it's. <laughs> That's a story. It's a kind of story. <laughs> There's very much a, um, car and you can do things to different elements of the car and then drive it around to places Mm. i believe that you are actually at any point heading to a location i never successfully reached any of those locations and was involved in several multi-car (laughs) pileups i remember this you wrote this for rps didn't you at the time yeah a, a car drove into the back of me and then it was sort of at such an angle that I couldn't go forward and they wouldn't go backwards. So I just sort of got out and left uncle in the passenger seat and just sort of walked down the road for about half an hour <laughs> to see if I could go back to the start and get a new car. And then what happened? I got lost. Okay. <laughs> um and then, and then I started that new file, which is how I got trapped in the sausage shop. 
<laughs> because I had the sausages in my hand, but my um, wallet was in the car, I think. So I was trying to go out to get the money to pay for the sausages and didn't realise that because the game thought that I was stealing the sausages, that was why the door was locked. I thought it was just locked because it was night time. So I just stayed there waiting for the door to open. <laughs> And it never did, <laughs> so I never played it again. <laughs> Every new session of Jalopy is a different M. John Harrison sort of story. <laughs> uh, and that's, uh, yeah, no, that's that's the game that's out this week. I haven't played it. I'd like to actually, now that it's out. I actually didn't realise it wasn't out, but... I think it has had all of the key locations in for a while. So. Sausage shop, side of the road. <laughs> no, but, it had, you know, there was a lot of different um, Eastern European kind of... Um, uh, countries and locations that they're adding to the game as it was being built mm. out and like you're figuring out, you know, the different, um, elements. Like I think uncle is now no longer a passenger, I think. Huh. And that's quite a big change. Yeah. What is he now? I don't know. I, I'm <laughs> stuck in the sausage shop. Um, but also stuff like, um, I remember, because uh, I used to read the the Tumblr where there were all the different questions that people would ask the dev and the dev would respond. Um, and so there was always a lot of back and forth about what you could use the back seat for because you couldn't. And so there was sort of this ongoing thing of people making suggestions for what you could use it for and asking why you couldn't use it. And then the dev trying to figure out like what you could put on the back seat to make it obvious that you couldn't use the back seat and right. things like that. So... What did yeah. they do in the end? Uh, I think there's now just a lot of, um, you know, traveling paraphernalia, you know, like right. blankets or boxes or whatever. Mm. Um, obviously you can still use the boot and stuff, but that's, I think that's the state that it was at when I last looked because I have a vague memory of photoshopping uncle's arm onto the pile of blankets on the back seat as if he was being, you know, <laughs> As if he was sort of, you know, maybe a body that was being transported. Uh, Creepy. Yeah, I don't really remember why I did that anymore. Um, I assume there was a joke there. I don't know. It feels quite dark now. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm. yeah. Mm. The, uh, the, the final bit of n- n- news, and this I did hoist out of GDC, I think was from the, uh, GDC talk by the, uh, Edith Finch developers. Oh, yes. Who said that their next didn't revolve much. They're hiring animators, um, for a game that will be about animal locomotion. Oh, yeah. I think, um, James, uh, was at that panel, uh, mm. from PC Gamer. Yeah. Well, it was his story about it that, um, good I, work. I, I, well, linked to in the show notes because it's where I got this he thought from. It and was like, should I write this? And I said, I'd read it. <laughs> yeah. Have you? Uh, no. <laughs> In chat. <laughs> but um, you read it, which mm, is almost the same thing. But I thought I thought this would be, uh, you know, that this is this is relevant to to your interests. Yes, I love animals, and you enjoyed Edith Finch, I think. Uh, yes, I really did. Yeah, I'm assuming it will have a um, a bird mentioned in the name as well as is there. That's true. Their yeah, all, all of them. What that? What could that be? Um, heron. Just heron. <laughs> Uh, you asked me to name a bird, as I mean, far as I'm aware. Well, yeah, okay, fine. You did. <laughs> like, what, what? <laughs> I don't understand how I've fallen short in your estimation. <laughs> you haven't. It's just that, you know, I, I was just assumed you might come up with some... The highly polished heron. Perfect. Great. Extremely well polished. The shiniest heron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Good. <laughs> uh, your turn. Herons of the storm. No, because heron <laughs> is already taken. Okay. I didn't realise those were the rules of the game. Well, you know, you can't just coast on my success. Okay. You can't ride my coattails. Or tail feathers. That's what? What? No, that's a phrase. I know that's a phrase. Yes, it is. I just... Oh, anyway, I'm so <laughs> confused. <laughs> Look, I, was, I haven't tried to derail anything. This is just happening. <laughs> um... But yes, you know, that seemed like a nice... I like how you say, but yes. As if it's just, is. it's the, it's the desperate, <laughs> it's the desperate non sequiturs of a man trying to, trying to get a train back on the rails. <laughs> a locomotive made of animals. Yeah, and, yeah, an animal locomotive. Yeah. What's the, um, what's the little cartoon where the animals ride around in a train? 
What am I thinking Train of? Animals. I'm thinking of, I'm either thinking of Sylvanian Families, which isn't a cartoon, or Barbar, where I'm basically sure there's only like momentarily a train. Yeah, they live in a palace. They do. And it's, I, it, there might be a train system. I don't know. I'm not, you know, <laughs> entirely conversant with the, you know, the public transport <laughs> system of an elephant principality. <laughs> So, I wouldn't expect you to be, and it's unreasonable of me to have even raised the subject. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, good. That that whole that whole matter, that whole subject of discussion is is just one. Uh, on that big was old the dead news. end. Yeah, that was the news. <laughs> Bye. Bye, news. As you toddle off into this, I'm sure there's more stuff out of GDC, but I think you should probably get it from Tom F's uh, mouth and face next week mm. when he's back, and he can tell us how much fun he had. I won't be listening. No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go. I'd love to go to GDC. I've I've had the GDC fear of missing out feeling. What's what's the not the fear of missing out, but just wishing you would at the cool thing everyone's enjoying. Envy. Envy. That's the yeah, you're, <laughs> you're quite right. That is the word. Um <laughs> <laughs> I mean <laughs> yeah, you, you're completely right. And I just I feel like a fool. Um, the, I've had that feeling and envy, um, uh, about this, uh, since before I was a games journalist. So like, I've always wanted to go. GDC or E3? GDC, GDC. Yeah. E3 was like a kind of curiosity. Like I, I wanted to see what it was like. And I've been to a Gamescom. So I got the impression of like, what if this, but in LA? Mm. Um, I've done consumer games once, but I never done GDC, and everyone always seems to have such an amazing time that uh, uh, now I only regard it from a position of distant uh, bitterment, bitterment, bitterness. I'm sorry, Pip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad that you're no longer trying to like act as if this is on me somehow. <laughs> I'm fully capable of self derailing. <laughs> the stupid thing is, you're drinking. I'm having a coffee, so this yes. should. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm not drinking much. You've been to a GDC though, haven't you, Pip? Two. Two. Two of them. Hmm. Next one would have been my GD3. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. There's a really nice um, botanical garden in um, San Francisco. And also um, in Golden Gate Park, they have the California... Um, I can't remember if it's like the Center for Sciences or Academy of Science or something, but they have like a little rainforest bit indoors and um, like an aquarium. And, you know, I, I remember I had to sort of wait for a butterfly to stop being on me, I think, at one point and a cafe. <laughs> but that was really nice. GDC really highlights. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, because it's like... California, I mean, San Francisco specifically, like, it's a very strange place to, to be in. And, mm. and, you know, you do need to perform a bit of self care, I think, because otherwise it's like anything you get massively burnt out on the conference itself. And San Francisco is a very strange place in terms of, you know, ma it, it, it's, there's a very specific thing. Um, very specific to San Francisco thing where massively successful tech companies are like, you know, right alongside extreme poverty mm, and exactly um, mean. mental yeah. illness, uh, and, you know, just sort of that, that highly visible disparity can be very, I, I don't want to say, I, I mean, it is unsettling. And I know that that sounds odd as a kind of, you know, it, it, that, that's the sentiment from someone who obviously is an outsider and, you know, I, there's very little that I could sort of try and do in the moment. Like I sort of mm. looked into things that I might be able to sort of contribute to and so on um, and where I might sort of spend my money, you know, uh, while I'm there to to sort of make that feel less like I was contributing almost, mm. you know, like on my way past to go to you know, a, an expensive tech conference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've um, never felt comfortable in San Francisco. So things like that. So, it's you know, you sort of find, you know, ways of almost just not being there or sort of seeing the good in the city as well mm. to, to try and... I Yeah. That's a perfectly reasonable odd. answer. That was, <laughs> but, yeah, you've made me feel less bad about not ever going to a GDC. So, <laughs> thank you. What have you been playing then, Pip, in order to bring things back to the UK where the we are under the now yes 
Um, well, because we, for the magazine, have been working on uh, stuff to do with free games for features and things, I actually ended up play, replaying an awful lot of stuff uh, in that, you know, um, mm. oeuvre, uh, or set of. Uh, and so it's uh, it's one of those things where I don't have anything I think that I can talk about in a, in a hugely in-depth fashion. Mm. Um, but I have an awful lot of you know, I have played these five minute long things or re, you know, uh, rekindled my affection for, you know, things from, from a little while ago. So we can run through a bunch of those. If It'd you be like. cool to know what things, cause as it's a lot of games, but it'd be cool to know what things either jumped out to you that you had forgotten thanks to your superpower of being able to re-experience <laughs> entertainment. Um, <laughs> Um, or that, you know, we're sort of new, like, obviously, I don't think anyone's looking for 55 minute games to play necessarily, but, but it'd be nice to know which ones are like, if I want to play three mm. or five, Firstly, which ones? I would say, and this is all I'm going to say on this particular game, play Skeel if you haven't. How does one spell that? It is S-K-E-A-L. Mm. And the less you know going in, the better. Because it was one that Alice has mentioned multiple times to me previously when we were at RPS and I always forgot to play it. So playing it this time around, I understood. Mm. <laughs> is it is it the sort of thing that you would... Obviously, I won't ask you to... to it takes it three minutes okay, and it you... is sublime. Okay, good. All right. It's not something... Like, the only, the only question I would ask about anything like that would be, is it something that people should be warned about no. scariness or anything like that? No, no. Okay. I, I, I would have if it was. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not one for for not giving people content warnings. If they're for needed. sure. I just thought I'd check because obviously so people suggest... might not want to spook. No, no, that's, but that's all we need to say. Okay, I'll put a link in the show notes with no other information. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, also, I, in the replay sort of side of things, I played Birdland again, which I haven't done for years now, actually. Mm. Um, it's a sort of a, a surreal twine story about uh, a, a girl called Bridget, uh, who is at summer camp. And things start just becoming weird and she's interrogated by birds during her dreams and mm. things like that. And it was just, I had not thought about that in a long time, actually. And it was a delight going back in and playing. What's the tone? Again. What's kind of? Sort of surreal, but sweet, you know, mm. um, kind of like a, a radio play kind of thing, I would right. say, or like one of those odd stories that sort of does have a conclusion and... You know, that kind of thing. There's mm. kind of, yeah, it, it unfolds and builds to something, mm. which is really nice. And like the characters are like enjoyable to spend time with and, you know, things like that. So mm. that's nice. Um, and also Dog of Dracula 2, which is <laughs> <laughs> a complete tonal so shift. Three of my favorite nouns. <laughs> so this is something that I found when I was waiting for Alice to come over one evening. So I'd sort of already cracked open a bottle of wine and was like, wandering around some freeware sites. <laughs> um, <laughs> like you do. And this is essentially a sort of cyberpunk future where I think, I, I genuinely still don't know if there was a Dog of Dracula 1 because it sort of summarizes it at the beginning as if there was. Mm. But I've never looked it up and never felt the need to because Dog of Dracula 2 was enough for me. <laughs> um, you know, so anyway, uh, you're sort of in a, I think it's Nuevo Tokyo um, after the overthrow of a tyrant who prohibited condiments. Um, right. And so there's a lot of references was, is to it like that kind of dog outlawed sort of what, what like the kind of dog that takes condiments a hot dog oh i see no it's a it's an actual dog oh okay it's a small dog in a dracula cape with a cyborg eye implant dog of okay so he's dog he's dracula's dog well so <laughs> i think the idea is that he has absorbed the powers of dracula but that isn't really relevant here he's just okay. a cape sorry and I, i'm a asking green Mohican and cyber implants and you know, sort of knows you, the the orange suited, sort of down on his luck protagonist. 
Oh, so you're not Dog of Dracula? No, no, he's your friend. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> colleague. <laughs> Acquaintance. <laughs> he's, he's a, LinkedIn he's a, a connection. He's a key part of your life, but, you know, to sort of explain the dynamic further would be to ruin crucial plot elements. Okay, I'm sorry. So, and again, that's like a short thing, and it's just this, it, it, it properly just commits to the thing it's doing. What, it's what is the lovely. key mechanic? It's like, a point and click. Oh, it's a point and click. Okay, so... Uh, so like, but not particularly. Dating sim? Like, like, it's a, you know, you just sort of interact with the world in the in, in a point and clicky fashion, but not in the puzzle-solving-y, tedious right. way that that might imply. Hmm. It's very energetic and earnest in the best silly way. That sounds great. Mm, yes. So, uh, there was that. Um let me just see. I'm actually just looking at my list now because I I wrote mm. things down for this podcast because I knew my memory was so terrible. <laughs> um, I actually, for the first time, I played my father's long, long legs. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is a horror game. <laughs> I don't even know what that when means. When you're done. I don't even know what it means, but I was tickled. Okay. <laughs> I just wasn't expecting. You set. don't take me seriously. <laughs> Let's discuss that afterwards. <laughs> um, it's, it's another text, uh, based thing. Um, mm. but it, uh, it's just so atmospheric and so well written. And there are a few, um, mechanical things that it adds in at various points for, you know, to good effect. Um, but ultimately it's a short thing. It's very creepy. It's unsettling rather than, you know, jump scary or anything. Mm. And it's kind of quite a tense experience, but I think it's accessible. Did you say that was a text adventure? Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm not going to say the title again because it'll just make you giggle. It's only in the sentence. It's only in the sentence, I've been playing my father's long, long legs. Because my brain fills in the rest of that sentence like a banjo. <laughs> I think that's on you. It is on me. I'm not I'm not going to deny that. <laughs> um, I also sort of wanted to, you know, highlight things that are parts of... Or that, that are parts of, um, the work of studios I really like or developers that I really like. So, you know, things by Studio Leo Mingus, uh, who are sort of gradually releasing bits and pieces as facets of a broader idea. Mm. Um, there are a really interesting studio with some gorgeous artwork as well. So the thing that is easiest, I assume, for most people to play because it's on Steam and it's free of charge is a museum of uh, dubious splendors. And it, um, it, it has you wandering this space where, um, everyday objects are just sort of blown up to really sort of impressive size and then exhibited almost in a kind of, you know, museum-esque setting. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's really bright and beautifully executed and those motifs carry through from their other work. Um, and it's, uh, but every time you go through to a new space, you also get a snippet of a story from a storybook that they say that they're exploring with this. And, you know, they sort of do really interesting things with like meta fiction and meta narratives. And, you know, it's sort of like, there's a, a strand of probably Italo Calvino is the oh, cool. The I, easiest, I, should, um, I should play this then thing to to refer to uh for yeah specifically for you to to have a handle on how that maybe mm. plays out um and also uh you know just things like um oh what was the other thing that i was gonna say uh, uh sorry it's completely gone out of my head oh stick shift so you know for robert yang's work as mm. kind of oh of course yeah it it it's very much uh it's funny and it's fun but it also has a lot of sort of it it touches on a lot of quite serious politics mm, and we should explain what just stick shift so is so stick shift context. is you are uh masturbating a car to completion <laughs> by um moving your mouse rhythmically and ascending through a series of gear changes <laughs> Um, and it is glorious and it is so well done and it's, you know, just really, um, 
the thing that I love about Robert Yang's work is that, you know, it's that thing of you can raise or broach serious things and have serious thoughts when you make these things and still end up with something that is just gloriously fun to play. Yeah. And that, that can provoke really interesting reactions mm. and sort of, you know, it's, it, it's just so well balanced between those things, I think. And, um, you know, the accompanying, uh, blog entries that, uh, he puts up are always, you know, super worth reading and dig into particular things and give you lots of sort of, um, entry points for, you know, uh, further research or, you know, just sort of idle Googling about particular things and educating. So what are those sort of the, the subjects that stick shift raises on the more serious side? Cause obviously it's got a comic element. Well, this is the thing. I don't want to butcher, um, butcher particular like, um, thoughts because this was me just trying to do like a, Oh, a for sure. Down. For sure. It's just to give um, you more of a specific sense. So I sense. would say, shall we put in the, in the, um, show notes like the actual link to sure, uh, yeah. where he's talking about the the game itself mm -hmm. um and sort of what what he was getting at while because you know it does interesting things like for example um not representing sex literally yeah specifically you know it's it's you with this you know phallic gear lever right yeah or gear stick rather um you know just sort of having that motion you know going because uh, it's not it's not explicit mm, but it is but erotic if you are sat there at work playing through this for a list feature you are so aware of like the stroking motion <laughs> and the fact that you are sort of trying to you know and and this is also it's interesting because it's not about the um the driver that your character getting off you are the one that is getting mm. this other entity off right it's yeah. all about them and the fact that you are responding to you know, you are keeping an eye on their engine and their, you know, like their level of being into it and having to adapt and change what you do and, and alter it accordingly. And sort of that's an interesting thing because it's not about the player's own gratification. It's about the feeling of, you know, accomplishment that you would get from, you know, um, from, so the achievement isn't you getting off it's the sort of that referred enjoyment of yeah getting a car off <laughs> well yes <laughs> yeah, basically yeah. but you know and, and that sort of that that element of just you know it being mm. funny and fun means that those thoughts are sort of free to come to you rather than you know the whole thing just really ramming that home it through text mm. or through you know just absolutely um non you know through something literal right yeah 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 and yeah and, and you know it's so such a rarely explored subject in games at all mm. or so, not even subject like aspect of human experience that um this is maybe one of the most interesting ways that games can approach it is mm. sort of show you the links in a kind of creative way like that so it's um i I think probably the the way that I think the way that you get hold of the most recent version, like I think you can get the standalone version, but I think it might be slightly older. So, um, is uh, the Radiator Two collection, which has um, Succulent and Hurt Me Plenty as well mm. uh, in there as well. So, but yeah, so. cool links in show notes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and um, like I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but uh, Chertzer maybe Spell? it's a kitty horror show game mm, okay. um and it's that one is more along the lines of for example uh to to pick a well-known thing um like a one of the segments of welcome to night Vale or something you know it's that kind of like creeping horror or mm. you know sort of the 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 surreal cosmic kind of elements of you know like pyramids floating or you know demanding things from you sacrifices you know mm. um but all of uh kitty horror shows um back catalog has you know that you know interesting elements of that running through it so i would say it's another thing where it was just this is an example but raid the yeah, back yeah. catalog how do you spell um just for people who don't want to check the show notes but want to find it uh c h Y R Z A, I think. Okay. It's, yeah, it's, <coughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then just things like, um, 
I, I really love Little Party because it's about, you know, it's it's the same uh, people that did um, A Good Gardener, mm. which is a really interesting thing as well. Um, but it's uh, you play as uh, the mum of a your daughter, I think her name's Suzanne, is hosting a party for her, like, art friends. You know, they're all working on, like, their little individual projects in your house. But you aren't a member of that group you're actually playing as the person who now has to sort of make themselves scarce in their own house but like also has things that they need to be getting on with and yeah you know doesn't want to completely not interact and and so that's one of the the reasons that i love free games so much is that they Mm. can so often give you you know just these tiny bursts of an experience that is um not often presented in the the more um i don't even want to say triple a but just you know the sort of maybe more the traditional framework of a game as we understand it normally i don't think that even applies yeah i mean hopefully people listening to this know what we're getting at even though the language is inexact because i haven't you know planned this out meticulously um but it you know it's how many times have you played as you know a a parent specifically a mum who is sort of trying not to interfere but also you know it's her home and is interested and is polite you know i think that's the thing is is partly a five minute game is free from pressure to make those experiences last a certain amount of time or fit together as part of a bigger whole like it's not it's not a simulation of the entire life of being a mother of teenagers or something like that. It's just this one specific experience. It doesn't, you know, because those sort of exponential difficult like production difficulties only set in when you try and do everything. Yeah, it's it's, a, it's it's I like it when games are free to do one thing and just leave it at that. Yeah, and that tends to come in the form of these short free games. Sometimes you see it in in a, in a bigger format. Yeah, and that's maybe slightly sort of maybe I don't know how something like we talked about it recently on the pod, but like Thirty Fights of Loving, which is super short, but uh, not free, um, but is Gravity Bones free? Though, Gravity Bones free, and both of them are sort of like micro spy stories, but they're not. It's not quite the same thing because it's not like we're going to present one experience. It's more about I'm going to tell you a story in mm. the smallest, shortest number of words, basically, shortest number of smallest number of images. Um, but I do like whenever I like when the the requirement to sort of furnish an experience of a particular length is taken off. Basically. Yeah, yeah, or even to sort of you know um, give it a you know a beginning and an end or a goal state or you know anything like that. It just sort of it it really lets you just do a vignette or like a, a sn- snippet of a vignette, right? Yeah, yeah, so, a vignette of a vignette. <laughs> so yeah, it's, and and obviously there's so much more in the in the list. So I'm not you know hopefully I haven't made people not want to to pick up the magazine because you know we put a lot of work into that one and it was you know it's really hopefully gives people a selection box of cool stuff that they can dip into right yeah yeah be surprised by and be delighted by and like there are a whole bunch of things like there's um you know so many games in there that i haven't played either but that other people on the team had and that are now on my kind of oh okay you know what was that Mm. you know that i'm super excited about i just didn't want to sort of speak for them for sure yeah whatever so yeah there's just like so much i i just really love that going on um itch and just um you know going through recent games is one of my favorite things to do because i always find something right yeah yeah so and like there are just so many sort of student projects and if you keep an eye on like game jams and things like that then you know if you if you really feel overwhelmed by it because there are so many things that i'm used to picking through broken games and just going okay fine you know Mm. next 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 which maybe isn't great for you know maybe missing a few things that you, you don't give the time to unfold but it's like you know at that point you're just going okay well I've only got a certain amount of time and this thing is broken. So, (laughs) um, but you know, some, some games, some of the bigger game jams certainly have, um, winners categories and stuff. So Mm. if you go back once they're concluded, then you can often sort of get like a, a sense of the ones that are, you know, that reliably work and do something interesting. Mm. So yeah, like if people are feeling a bit stuck or don't really know how to 
start digging into those, that's a that's a good place to start, I would say. Good. Mm. Mm. Like Ludum Dare does that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there are things like the Global Game Jam, which are so big and have, you know, interesting themes. So, yeah. Mm. Mm. What would be on your list? Of short games? Yeah, or like free games. Um, actually, so I haven't thought about this for a long time because I, I used to, back when I was on the magazine, PCA magazine, I used to um, be in charge of the section that has been removed for the right reason where we had like free games at the back, basically. Oh, okay. Um, and that was a good a good idea to actually say that, look, free games are furnishing. They don't need putting in their own box because they are furnishing experiences that are as reviewable and valid as active game designers things you pay for. Uh, but back in the day, when basically because what happened with PC Gamer is um, – we replaced the cover disc with a downloadable code, which made sense to join the century that we're currently in. Um, and then as a consequence, we kind of replaced what would have previously been the what's on the disc section with a stuff you can just go and download section. And I used to write that. And when I was writing that, I was always looking through Ludum Dare um, winners categories and stuff. I think this was the days before itch even, but like mm. um, for stuff. But in recent years, moving away from that side of work, I haven't actually... I haven't actually gone looking for this stuff when someone hasn't pointed it, pointed me at it. Mm. So, yeah, I know that's a long way of saying that I don't really have an answer to that. I mean, like the thing I will always say is that we've already mentioned it is like gravity, but like any, any Blendo thing mm. out of the free lot, I will always recommend. But then again, I think my favorite games of his are all paid. So that's not great advice either. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think what else. Hmm. No, off the top of my head, no. There isn't something, but that's simply because it's been years since I've properly dug into this. Because what I require other people for. Yeah, because you play a lot of free games, but they're free to play rather than. Free yeah, I wouldn't. I would like. I'm not gonna. Mean, I, I definitely wasn't gonna say Dota Two, oh, that no, five minute sure. game. But it's um, interesting because that is something that you have to work out how you're going to position. Because if you do say that you're talking about free games, those technically are free, right? That's, that's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. That they have very different production values and fulfill a very different remit and space in people's lives. And the, not the hint, but the understanding is that enough people will spend money on them that they will be viable, right? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. And I think it's, this brings out my lack of ability to really easily answer the question you asked me is actually the, the act of seeking out and playing and sort of, um, you know, uh, getting enjoyment out of free indie games, for example, free short experiences is actually basically almost as time consuming and as much, uh, you know, a, a hobby unto itself as getting into any other sort of game that like, it's not, it is not easy for somebody to just go, I'm going to find a free game to play and, and land on this stuff straight away. You have to get, you know, you can be helped along that journey by articles and then things like that and people recommendations. But Nobody has, nobody is born with an intuitive sense of where to find the best stuff and it has to be learned. Mm. And like any other medium where people, whether that's people who, you know, don't listen to anything that isn't, you know, on a SoundCloud somewhere with 30 plays, like, you know, whatever, me every medium has its, uh, sort of, sort of fringe aspect where you can go looking for really interesting stuff that's happening at the sidelines. But often that actually has the highest, one of the highest barriers to entry when it comes to simply finding stuff, even if the experiences themselves are uh, more accessible. Mm, yeah. I think it's, um, it reminds me a lot of uh, any fringe thing, like whether it's theater or art or, yeah. you know, whatever else, because, you know, I think there's a lot of that, uh, there's that sense of, okay, well, there's just so much you get overloaded and you have initially, you might actually feel like you have no sense of how to make value judgments with that in mind. It's mm. like, what am I even looking for? What is this space for? Am I applying the right, you know, critical framework at all at yeah. this point? If I haven't understood any of the games that I've booted up in the last hour and a half, then does that mean that this space isn't for me or have I just not found the right thing? Like, do I persevere? Do I look somewhere else? And that can be really interesting. And I think, um, I wonder whether, because those spaces can also be elitist. Like I really hope that we try and make it not because I yeah. would just love people to play things that they like and it doesn't matter if it's timely or not. But, you know, I think that, that, 
people can get quite gatekeepery, especially if they totally, or not yeah. especially, but you know, and sometimes it comes from people who maybe have felt excluded from the mainstream because it's like, but this is our space. So what are you doing here? And if you don't get it, it's like, you know, are, are you here to, and, and not in a mean way, but just in a kind of, are you here to threaten a thing that is hugely valuable to me? Like if you don't get it and you're slagging it off, like, is it, Yeah, yeah. what does that mean for your approach to me kind of thing? So I think people can get sort of that there's a lot of emotional, um, investment for various reasons that I think it's, it's as well to understand, even if it's something that you then choose to, you know, ignore or embrace or, it, mm. you know, not in a mean way, but just in a kind of, you know, whether you leave it to one side or not. Um, and uh, I think as well, you know, that, that sense on the internet, when someone sends you a, uh, a gif or something and you've seen it before, even if it was only a day ago. Yeah. And yeah. like, there's that sort of, there's sometimes that knee jerk reaction of, I need to somehow prove that I already knew this thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that means the internet's sort of the, the digital culture can be even more forbidding in that sense like if you discover you know a game six months too late or you know too late being in air quotes you know you are you also going to look silly in front of the gatekeepers or do you know what i mean and yeah yeah and i want to stress that i don't i think most people don't do that stuff it's just that it, it can feel a bit worrying like oh have i just made a faux pas of saying this is really exciting and it's like because it's new to you it is genuinely exciting and that's fine you know it's it's more just that you know other people who have the the longer view will be like yeah but it also replicates this thing from like three years ago that you know means that it isn't the innovative thing that you think it is and because um uh, on a related note i actually reviewed um doki doki literature club for PC Gamer, um, which is a free game. And it, so it, it has a lot of content warnings and it needs them. Mm. Like it, it gets to the point in the game itself where it, it, it at least explains why it has used them. I don't think that necessarily makes it worthwhile or it means that it doesn't need those warnings. It just, yeah. 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 It, anyway that's a whole different conversation but for me it i didn't rate it as highly as other people i know have because for me i had seen a lot of what it did in other games often free games that are sort of you know maybe not as well known it's just that Doki Doki brings them together in a sort of almost like a critical mass and mm. at a moment when people want to play that kind of game for various reasons, whether it's related to streaming or like um, particular sort of um, school or college culture, you know, it's, um, but, but that meant that from my perspective, I, you know, that kind of, it knocks points off a bit because I have seen that stuff before. So a game that, for example, someone who, has sort of never seen any of that stuff before or hadn't played the games that mm. I had played would kind of maybe go, oh, this is really interesting and it does all of these things and like, oh, that's super exciting and, you know, all of that stuff. And I'm kind of going, okay, well, it's borrowing from this and this and this and this. And, you know, some of them do far more interesting things with that specific yeah. element. So it's less, it maybe it's less points knocked off so much as it's not getting the the points for, novelty or originality that other people might grant it yeah i think that's yeah that's a, a lot better way of phrasing it or even just that it doesn't evoke the response that it gets in some people you know like i'm not going to yeah have that sense of oh this is such a new thing because, yes because you can you can acknowledge yeah. that for some people it, it will be mm. the first time experiencing something like that but at the same time you can also in the same thing and say this might be your first time experiencing this but it's been done better elsewhere and you might want to experiment you might want to play those games instead I think it like something that in an ideal world I would do is at the foot of, you know, every game that I would write about is have that thing of, okay, well, if you enjoyed this aspect of it, go play this. If you enjoyed that aspect, this is a thing that I think you might really like, you know, having a kind of, and I know that that's what recommendation engines are supposed to do, but I think that often people can get such different things out of a game, right? You can yeah. play things such different ways that... 
you know, just saying you enjoyed Overwatch, therefore you might enjoy Battlefield One. Yeah, or like Counter Strike or yeah. something. It it can sometimes you know obviously in a broad way it, it can be useful and depending on the data that you've got and the granularity of it, it you you might make better recommendations but you know i think that that human touch of like okay well why did you like this thing and okay that's interesting well have you you know did you know about this particular game jam that really zeroes in on that thing or yeah. yeah, I think I think kind of the whole the, the thing that binds together a lot of the different issues you've raised is that you know games have scenes. Every every media, every form of art or culture has um, sort of scenes or subcultures, which would kind of be defined as like uh, places where kind of whether you kind of require a certain amount of knowledge or a certain amount of knowledge to participate, or there's a feeling that you do. Mm. And different, you know, there's so many different forms of social or personal kind of pressure that can be exerted, good and bad, mm. by the way those things operate. And, you know, we're at a point where you have to acknowledge that about games, which is why, um, you know, that's kind of what I'm saying, that, like, getting into free games, for example, getting into new itch stuff for game jams is a hobby it is yeah. a it is it is like being into fringe theater or something you can and, fall out of date so quickly and that's kind of well. what i was about to say as well so like i used to follow that stuff quite closely because i requ- not because i and i didn't stop and enjoy it I just my interest and my attention and my professional stuff kind of moved in a different direction um and having been out of date it's then super hard to say uh, to go back, not, not to go back in, cause that just takes, you know, a little bit of reacclimatizing or get a, a new sense of which jams are producing interesting games at the moment, those kinds of things. But you don't have a fresh answer to that question, right? Mm, like, yeah. if, you know, like, and I feel, I feel the same way about fringe theater, which is something I used to be super into and I haven't paid attention to for the better part of five years because I don't live in a city where it's as sort of um prevalent as it was in the places i previously lived i'm feeling it with my art exhibition yeah knowledge. and so if someone tells me oh what french theater that i should see i don't want to give you an answer that's five years old mm. so i would probably just go i don't know even though i would also qualify as an interest does that make sense and that's oh, and, for and sure. i think the reason i brought this up is because i appreciate that a lot of people will listen to this and um and i think maybe PC gamers old format for presenting free games almost made the mistake of not acknowledging that in presenting these as just like free downloadables and in acknowledging the kind of sort of uh, work it takes to be a kind of uh, conversant part of that community, whether that's actually yeah. socially or just yourself. And the downside, so the downside to just saying like, here's some just links to stuff you can download is it doesn't give you the apparatus to go and find it yourself necessarily. Mm. The good thing about it actually, and maybe the, the accidental good of a quite sort of old school magazine approach to like presenting games was that it actually made it, 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 uh, bypassed any sense that these communities were gatekeepery or kind of hard to get into. You know what I mean? It just sort of comp- it almost naively presents them as like, just go play this. Mm. and presents it in a context alongside you know we would have a free game which might have a really interesting high concept or a, a story you wouldn't have find anywhere else or an experience you wouldn't find anywhere else in games next to like here's the coolest mod for mountain blade mm. uh, you know super trad pc gaming kind of heartland thing and i always liked uh that juxtaposition because it sort of established that these both these things are equal yeah even though we would put a countdown next to them because of course we did but yeah. like you know there's um I guess what I'm saying is that, like, those kinds of media, sort of thing I'm familiar with, used to be kind of, like, blithely unaware of the way subcultures form within the culture of games. Um, but now I'm more aware of it, and I become more conscious of that whenever, basically, I'm asked, what cool free thing did you play recently? Because it makes me feel super out of touch, basically. Yeah, and that's a, that's a kind of good, almost like a good demonstration of it, because, um, obviously, people... or. I would hope that people listening to this know that, you know, would be able to tell that that wasn't a gotcha question. It wasn't an attempt to catch you out. And it's still entirely possible to feel put on the spot or, you know, uh, at sea with, with regard to the answer. Like I, I do it with regard to, uh, actually the, the more traditional end of the gaming spectrum. And I used to really, really worry about it because I would be in rooms, you know, at professional events just with people who would reference game after game after game that I just hadn't played and had no interest in playing because it just wasn't for me. Right. And when that is stuff that is also, um, 
considered the the must play kind of canon of video games that can be hugely isolating or you know really amp up the sort of sense of imposter syndrome and things in a way that i think um hopefully free games doesn't have that quite that loaded yeah element to it but i think it's only the sense of me just getting more confident in myself and my own interests that i just i can now be in that room and go you know and and have people say have you played this this and this and just say no to all and not feel like i'm somehow less than they are because you know yeah you know they probably don't know about you know the intricacies of the esports scene they probably don't know you know what this free game did or had or you know it's just everybody is is different but Mm. yeah it can be scary (laughs) i think i think slowly the sense of there's like a center of games and everything else is sort of orbit to periphery is fading a little bit or like practically it's nonsense because all sorts of people play all sorts of different games and all sorts of people locate their kind of center of interest in games in completely different places as in terms of media and the way people talk about games and the way that sort of games are presented within the games industry there definitely is a kind of triple a core of sort of a canon um but i think that's fracturing i think it's slowly kind of coming apart which is nice some and some and i think obviously part of this is just being in the middle of any change it's really hard to see how quickly it's actually happening or whether it's happening you know because you know you'll sort of sit there and and see something that someone's done and go oh that's progress and then you'll you know maybe even in the next minute run up against a massive roadblock and go oh nothing's changed yeah and so it it can just be this really uh, i cannot tell you that because i'm inside it and i see as many things that that make me worry or make me sad as make me, you know, mm. happy, broadly happy, yeah. I would say. But it, yeah, it can often just depend on the kind of day you've had and the, the, the comments that you've seen or the emails that you've had or the, even just the schedule of games that's coming up as well can make you feel a bit like, Oh wow, am I relevant? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For <laughs> Are sure. my interests <laughs> of, and then sometimes it's just your time, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's just all octopus games all month. Yeah, well, like, when Edith Finch rolls around, I'm like, right, out of the way, everybody. (laughs) Here I am. When Dota's got a massive patch update, I'm like, I know all of the vocabulary you're going to need right now. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) If I'm not entirely up to date. (laughs) So, yeah, I just, yeah, I I find that really interesting. Hopefully it hasn't been too kind of highbrow, or not highbrow, but too um, uh, theoretical Mm. to be fun to listen to. (laughs) Can I tell you a very non-theoretical story about space? Uh, I have not worked out a way to stop you. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so and I will tell this story with, with some apologies to Alex Vulture, because I feel like I am about to talk about a game that I've played today uh, that I very much like and very charmed by. However, uh, I found out about it only because he wrote a article about it for PC Gamer. Uh, the game is called uh, Scavenger SV4. Mm-hmm. came out at the beginning of February, I think. So it's only been out for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, unless I misread the date, in which case it's been out for more than a year and everyone knows about it. But it, like, it doesn't have loads of reviews on Steam or anything. So it felt like a bit of a kind of like, oh, huh, I'd never heard of this. Mm. Um, and um, Alex sort of wrote an article for PC Gamer describing some of the things that happen in it. And I'll tell you more about specifics in a moment. Um, and I read the first half of that article before it got into stuff that I knew I wanted to play the game and it got into stuff that I didn't want to know. Mm. Not, not that's not Alex's fault at all. I think when you're explaining what it, this is a uh, kind of space horror roguelike and it's worth kind of, you know, it, it's one of those things that all of uh, both roguelikes and horror games, um, benefit from the element of surprise. So I knew I didn't want to read any more. So I didn't and I had my own experience with it. And I was all about that experience. And, uh, luckily I think for reasons, my own experience won't be too spoilery. Um, but um, I wanted to apologize, to Alex, because I feel like he could be on next week wanting to talk about this game, and I would have just completely hoisted well, this out from under him. If it makes you feel better, if I hadn't been talking about free games, I would have been talking about a game that Alex emailed me about the other day. So <laughs> <laughs> he's good, Alex. He's so really good. Nicking his, he nicking should just his have thoughts. a newsletter. Indeed, I think it's called <laughs> PC Gamer Rock Paper Shotgun Eurogamer. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> He's a good one. He is a good one. Follow him on Twitter at Rotation. At Rotating Al. Um, so. <laughs> That's not how you spell it. I know, but he can't spell it either, so I don't see why I should have to. I see. Um, so, uh, anyway, so Scavenger SV4 is a, 
uh, sort of first person roguelike horror science exploration game, uh, where it's really unique. It, so it's a first person game where you are a sort of lonely space traveler on board your spaceship and you, uh, you, uh, your spaceship doesn't have gravity. So you sort of float around a spaceship, interacting with terminals and kind of doing various tasks aboard the ship. And you're in orbit around a highly radioactive world that you have found, uh, where you suspect there to be highly valuable alien artifacts and technology that you can find. Um, so your, your top level, your job is to send a rover down to the planet's surface, drive it around, but in remote control, find stuff, bring it back to the ship, research it, find out what it is. Um, and hopefully over the course of your uh, multiple expeditions, uh, piece together a mystery of what happened on the planet. Now, there are various things about this that basically that's the top line and it becomes super interesting from there um, for loads of different reasons. One is that um, you can obviously name your character and your ship and stuff or you can randomly generate them. But every time you play, uh, it is does have permadeath and every time you play, um, you are a different person uh, on a different ship around a different planet. You have a diary entry at the start that I believe changes, like how your character came to find this planet, kind of what they're trying to find there. And I haven't seen exactly how this works, but the game promises the aspects of the, uh, what sort of the aspect of the logic of these alien artifacts and things changes. So your not only does your research progress get reset, but maybe some things you learn as a player don't become as relevant between playthroughs, which prevents you from having like being out of step with your character. That's the idea. I haven't tested that aspect of it. Um, and uh it, so it looks it looks quite retro in some ways it, it feels it looks like kind of half-life one and a half era kind of pc graphics lots of, sort of textures of that sort and kind of like chunky interactions and things like that um but it's all about like the devices on your ship so your ship has the kind of um even though you explore it in first person it has the, a lot of the same logic as something like ftl so there's a lot of uh, in different rooms, you have different terminals that allow you to do different things with the ship, and the ship is simulated to a greater or lesser extent. So uh, you can go to a particular control panel in the engine room, I think, and just start opening and closing doors around the ship, which you can also do by pressing the buttons. All the interfaces work like the computers in Doom 3, where you just point your mouse at them, and then you can actually like use your mouse cursor on the screen and stuff like that, and kind of very tactile and kind of gratifying. And the... Um, you, you know, you have lots of things to consider, like, um, your, uh, you know, oxygen and fuel and all these different things. And although I didn't become too concerned with them and the, uh, you are constantly suffering from radiation sickness because of the proximity of the planet. Um, and, but there's no UI cause you're just a person on a ship. Um, so you have to go to the medical center and scan yourself every now and then to find out how bad it's getting and then treat yourself. So that's, that's busy work. I'm not sure exactly what it adds, but I imagine it might become more complicated later on. Is there anything like, cause I think Subnautica has ways that you can tell whether, um, you know, you are affected by mm. anything, uh, you know. So I've, I've always treated it as soon as it got to a certain point. Cause I got quite, it was quite diligent about checking it. So I don't know basically okay. if it does, I suspect it might. Um, but yeah. And then there's, um, then like, and it's sort of, it's really not like, even though the graphics are quite rudimentary, it's really nice. The sort of sip, it feels simulation y in terms of how it works. So, um, you don't really ever touch anything yourself or carry anything around yourself. Uh, best example is the rover comes back from the planet, comes back and docks automatically in the, the rover bay, basically, which is in the cargo bay, uh, behind a sealed window then you have a terminal there where you can pull it up and you can see the sort of inventory slots of every part of the ship that has an inventory so like the rover has its own inventory the cargo bay has its own inventory the science lab has its own inventory the rover garage where you can fit new things to the rover has its own inventory cargo hold and so on um, and then what you do is you drag the items you want to move like from rover to science bay but then if you go out of that terminal and watch the rover you'll see the rover use its little hands to take the package out of itself put it on a little uh, platform the platform will go down into the ship and then there are like conveyor belts running through the floor of the ship that will take things to the right places huh. even if you rearrange stuff on shelves in a particular location you'll see a little pair of like armatures come out and actually move the thing so the physical position of all the stuff it, it's not like abstract icons on a grid inventory 
it is actually all physical huh. stuff in the environment, which is really nice, even though they're just boxes, really. Yeah. Does that add anything? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so it's very tactile. Mm. Um, and, and then, and that extends to like the way the rover works. So when you, uh, you deploy the rover and it will fly down to the planet's surface automatically by itself. And you can go to the bridge and connect to it, which means that you bring up the kind of rover UI. Mm. And initially this is sort of, as you'd expect, it's got like a grainy camera, which really helps the atmosphere on the planet. Like you only have, it's a bit, it looks a bit like the pictures you get back from like the Curiosity rover or something where it is just super grainy, kind of indistinct, which helps it feel super atmospheric, even though the graphics are pretty low res. So it'll be like some kind of freaky monolith emerging from a sand dune. You go over to it and then click a button to get the hands to pick it up and put it in the rover. But um, every aspect of that, um, all the rover's subsystems and how they are presented to you is something you can control. And it reminds me a lot of a pretty old um, PC shooter called Terra Nova, where you could, it, which was super ambitious and allowed you to do things like view the game from the cameras mounted to different tanks and vehicles that you had in your army even though it was a first person game so you could switch your main view with that of a squad mate even though you know you weren't necessarily controlling them and stuff like that Mm. so you can reassign any subsystem on the rover to any of the panels on its screen so it makes sense to have like its camera Mm. on the main screen but if you wanted that to be the battery readout, you can do that. So you can assign like a compass to this or like the, the generator to that or the or the microphone um, so that you can see sound waves for like how much sound is coming out of things. And if you want, you can withdraw power to the microphone to save power on the rover, which means that you can't hear anything anymore. Um, um, and there's all this sort of detail. And I say that because that's kind of like the base level. And as sci-fi... It work that that base level provides a sense of place. It feels like everything is a con- interconnected device, and things can kind of interact with that in in interesting ways. And then the promise of the game is the stuff you bring back will start to have an uncertain effect on the ship. And uh, so some of the things you bring back, you research them, and you're like, oh, this is like an armor plate for the rover, or this is a a scanner that will help me find items on the planet, or this is a gun for the rover, and things like that which I haven't needed yet. Um, but like. Um, uh, like uh, the bit I stopped reading in Alex's article was when he started to describe something really strange and kind of unsettling happening mm. on his ship as a consequence of something he'd stored. Yeah. And I don't want to go too much into detail, so I appreciate it. I don't want to avoid spoilers, but like, um, so one of my things I found during my first, uh, expedition to the planet's surface was a, a desiccated sort of organic mass of some kind, like something that had died presumably ten, tens of thousands of years ago. And the science module wouldn't tell me if it, or couldn't tell me if it was a body, if it was food, you know what I mean? Like there's no way of telling just that it's organic. So this immediately set off my big, like, no, thank you kind of alert in my brain or like if there's a, you know, and I started becoming super kind of careful about where and how I stored everything, like tr- really trying to like, live um, basically to do the most sensible things i possibly could and so i made a sort of executive decision um that anything that was like seemed really benign could go in the storage place but that would always be sealed um like i always keep the doors closed and use other routes around the ship to get where i needed to go and the thing that made me kind of nervous about that is that's also the room where your eva suit is if you need to do any kind of eva activity um which I had this, you know, you get this clawing feeling of like, God, if something happens, I have to go through that room, but that's the room where I'm keeping the alien stuff. Mm. So it's like, okay, well, um, and so much good horror happens in your mind. The reason I'm talking about in this granular detail is because this is where the kind of meat of the thing comes from, particularly for such a kind of simple game. Um, in some ways, it's very impressively detailed in others. Um, and, um, and so, I, I was like, okay, well, I'll, st- I'll keep kind of benign feeling stuff like gadgets I'm not going to use in there. I will keep um, specific upgrades I'm interested in swapping in and out of the rover in the rover garage. And uh, because the the rover bay itself, which is in a sealed, because the rover has to like eject itself into space, that has its own airlock that is o- opens when the rover leaves. And otherwise it's in a sealed little compartment that only has another, the only other door in it is a little door that opens, only opens when you tell the computer to take the rover from its launch bay to the rover garage. Mm. It it comes along a little track, door opens, and it's one of those video game doors that really communicates 
you're not supposed to go through here because it opens when the rover comes through and then it shuts again behind the rover. And there's no way to, I can tell, I think to, 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 to fiddle with that door yourself. So, um, so I was like, well, I never go in there. That's the only place I put the rover. So I'm just going to permanently open the airlock in the rover bay because I don't need it closed for any reason. I'll permanently open the airlock in there and I'm going to keep anything organic in there. So if it's desiccated, it can stay desiccated on the shelf. And therefore, if it wakes up or something terrifying happens, it's it's in the the part of the ship I don't go in where I can keep the atmosphere open. And so I played for maybe an hour like this, sort of slowly building up an understanding of where the planet was and, and building out my map of the planet, which is a, sort of a thing you do as you go and explore. And then I had, and I kind of want to, you should imagine this in slow motion. Um, so um, I... I'm going to close my eyes, but it's for imagining purposes, not because I want you to think that I'm bored or have gone to sleep. Okay. okay. Yes. Mm. Um, so I uh, bring the rover back and I've had a sort of, um, I'm, I've stuck something in the science bay for research purposes. And then when the rover comes back, it automatically closes its airlock behind it. So I'm like, oh, I want to go open that again. So I go to life support, open that airlock door and let the air dry, um, come out. And then I come back, but on the way back, I don't close the door behind me. And then I, um, and then I realized that, um, what I want to do is actually, I had a, uh, a, a thing I could stick in the rover that created a kind of beacon. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take a chance. I'm going to give the rover some armor. I'm going to go down to the planet service. I'm going to activate this beacon and see if anything responds to it. Nothing did. So I came back and I was like, well, any, every upgrade I install in the rover affects its carrying capacity. So I'm going to start stripping some stuff out so that I can carry more stuff. Like I've cleared enough of the map. Maybe I don't need a compass at the moment. Maybe I take the compass out for a bit. So I, uh, I'm st- stood there and I, uh, in the, in the, on the other side of the glass in the rover bay. And uh, I've come in through the, the door from the rover garage and I just press the button to uh, move the rover from its docking platform to the garage. And of course, as it does that, it's going to open the door between its docking bay and the garage. And so as it starts to move, I think, hang on, for about a second, my the room I'm in is suddenly going to be exposed to vacuum because I've opened the airlock. And I turn... And I look at the panel for the door next to me and I think, no, this is probably be fine. At which point the rover door opens and I immediately get like sucked through the room sideways. And then as the, the door opens just enough for the rover to come through, I kind of bash into the rover and then get pulled backwards out of the door into the rover bay and then back out of that airlock and just out into space. And I just have this, it happens so fast. I almost don't have a moment, don't have time to think about what's happened. Edges of my vision go red. I just hear my own heartbeat. And then my heartbeat stops. My character gasps. And then everything very, 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 very slowly fades to red. And it's over. And it was, I know that's such an anticlimax. It's one of the reasons I felt comfortable telling that entire story because I didn't actually encounter any of the weird stuff I was promised happened in this game. But it was, I will A, never make that mistake again. But I love stuff like that because it's basically the simulation was such that it allowed me to die as quickly as it's possible to die if you are careless with your spaceship. And that for me is kind of space horror. I really, really enjoy Like Not the fact that, you know, yeah, spooky alien things can happen, obviously, but just the fact that like death is so kind of possible and close and that I sort of got complacent for like a little moment and didn't close the door at the right way at the right time. And that more than anything else has let me really excited to play it again, even if it means re-experiencing some of the stuff near the start of the game. It might be one of those things that's really good the first time. And then like, if it happens just because you were careless, like after a long slog, you're like, Oh yeah, totally. And this might be because this, yeah. this is the sort of horror I enjoy, but I would totally, I would, I'd would be so charmed by the, lonely sci-fi exploration story that simply ends when someone leaves an airlock door open and leaves nothing resolved maybe that's me that mm. i was really taken with and it's it's a super cool little oddity like a space oddity if you will um i won't okay um <laughs> i think it's 11 quid on steam i paid that sort of just on the strength of the first half of alex's article and i will link alex's article people are curious because i think he had far 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 more kind of like 
explicit horror stuff happen in his, I think. Yeah. Uh, whereas I just ejected myself into space by accident with the most exciting thing being the moment where my brain went, this is probably fine right before that happened. Is it a debut game? Do you know? It might be. So I actually clicked on the developer's name who I've, I unfortunately can't remember off the top of my head. I think it might be work for a single developer. Okay. I don't know for sure. I really don't know. I actually, I really don't know anything about its development. I just, there's, there's a, there's, the, the developed by on Steam is someone's name. Oh, for sure. Um, but there's no other games listed. No, so I'm just well curious be, yeah. in case there was like something that it built on or that it came completely out of left field, but yeah. Left field, I think. Cool. So, well, I do not know, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's super cool. I would, I would definitely recommend people check it out because, um, well, if you, if the story I've just told is interesting to you, if, if you were bored to tears by the notion of a very granular buggy experience followed by ex- accidental space ejection, then, <laughs> then I'm sorry. It's probably not for you. Hello. I, Pip, would like to do some questions. Okay. Let's do some questions from the internet. <laughs> okay. Good, good, seamless break. <laughs> I thought I'll- they might need to remember who I was. I see. Because your explanations took a while. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, they were interesting. But, like, I didn't contribute at <laughs> <laughs> My explanations. Much like life. <laughs> <laughs> Alex writes, Hello. One, some time ago you discussed how to talk about games in a university admissions interview. I assume that's true. I don't remember. Uh, mm. <laughs> Having done some relevant work in admissions... I'm I- assuming it's that they'd asked about this. <laughs> Rather than just wandering in and being like, hello, have you played Mario Sunshine? <laughs> I, sh- I assume it's for like, you know, game design courses or something. I- this is something we actually did. I don't know why I don't remember. <laughs> um, you might not have been here. He continues, having done some relevant work in admissions, I wanted to generally endorse the advice you gave at the time. Oh, if good. A- <laughs> if a student could explain how games helped him or her think differently about the more traditional parts of a subject, philosophy, literature, etc. That would be particularly helpful. I remember this now. This was... <laughs> was the, I there? Maybe. Um, <laughs> this was the uh, the question of if games are... You know, basically bringing up games in a context, for example, a literature or philosophy interview, okay. where they may well have something interesting to inform your subject, but you're afraid of, I think, um, you know, talking to people who don't necessarily understand why yeah. or, what you're or trying to sound like maybe you're trying to elevate you know yeah 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 i it, yeah there's there's a way of saying that that doesn't sound weird but yeah you know what i mean yeah um so that was simply i think that's a statement but his question comes from a completely different angle which is too Uh, A writer I respect has said that he prepares to write by playing a few games of tic-tac-toe to get away from distractions and into the mindset for concentrated work. I've been doing the same with Tom Francis' Morph Blade, but now I'm uh, surviving to wave 50 building elaborate arrow to teleport to killing machines, which is fun but isn't so helpful for writing. Do you know of any small games which are repeatable and involving but don't last long or encourage you to play more rounds? No, and I say this as somebody who is currently playing a game while uh, I am not supposed to be. (laughs) (laughs) I I was just waiting for Chris to sort of finish a thing, and then I picked up Gardenscapes and started playing that, and then kind of carried on, and I've just put it down because it's so rude. And (laughs) uh, But also, who was that writer playing Tic-Tac-Toe with? Were they playing it with themselves? Or like, I want to know more about that. internet Tic-Tac-Toe. But, I mean, you just need paper. Or noughts and crosses, as it's actually called. But, but I mean, still. Yeah, but nonetheless, or, or maybe they're playing against the computer. But, I mean, okay, sure. Uh, <laughs> but still, I think anything that is, like, a short game that is fun, I, the ones that I know tend to be quite compulsive. And so I here's the thing. Might be a- the trick, a short game that isn't fun. <laughs> May I suggest Minesweeper? No. Why? Because I have spent many an hour playing okay. Minesweeper. Fine. Uh, your not fun is my five years of, you know, <laughs> problems. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I just, I think that uh, it might be the stuff helps you get into the mindset of, of, you know, maybe writing or concentrating, but, 
and this is obviously something that's going to be massively personal. Um, so it might just be that you, you need to maybe take a walk and shake stuff off, or it might be that you're the sort of person that does better with, you know, just being in a different room of the house, right? Or like having a, um, a browser plugin that prevents yeah. you from going to particular websites or even switching the internet off on whatever device you are using and just sort of writing in a vacuum. Because I think it, I think it just depends on what is likely to distract you or what is going to pull you out of the headspace in which you produce the thing that you are trying to to write i mean i know that some people find music really helpful i really don't i find it too distracting whereas i can stream you know whole series of reality tv because i find people chatting doesn't distract me it's like that's my yeah i'm the exact opposite i think a lot of people find music a lot easier than i do yeah i could never watch tv and work at the same time yeah, but it's, it's, and it's not TV that I'm particularly invested in. It's TV where I'm just familiar with the voices. So it's yeah. not, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to, you know, have the, well, I could put the West Wing on, but I wouldn't be able to tell you what happened in that episode. It's just that I know those actors' voices and right. it's just going on in the background, right? So, I mean, so this is the thing. Like, I think, I think you are correct that a big part of this comes down to just your ability to undistract yourself and anything can be just, distract like i don't i can't think i think of a short game that actively resists a longer session unless you're talking about the kinds of things we were discussing earlier but then seeking out and finding kind of one-off five minute experiences is enormously time consuming which is exactly what we were just talking about so that's not that's not appropriate either um there are there are games like because yeah because even something like something out one of my old kind of proper you know compulsions like devil daggers or super hexagon yeah they're punishingly difficult and they might frustrate you after a couple of minutes and that might be ideal for a short session i did used i did used to play devil daggers prior to doing anything because i found it a good warm-up but i'm also fully capable of losing hours to try and beat the score and i think if you're the kind of person that yeah you've now mastered morph played and you have that kind of you know mastery impulse towards games then that'll apply to like more or less anything um or even just if you aren't necessarily looking forward to the task that follows it at any point in time, yeah, your brain might well just go, no, nope, we're staying here. You're just going to hit repeat on this thing until, you know, <laughs> until the time has passed when the other thing was viable. Yeah, exactly. And so there's, there's no getting past that other than discipline, unfortunately. It might be worth, um, I, I, I'm interested in the idea of something being, useful in the sense of being a warm-up um although the the author of the email was specifically referring to writing perhaps yeah were they okay um because i remember i used to do a lot of life drawing classes and things and one of the things that you would often do at the beginning of a session is you know a series of maybe 30 second poses or something where the model would just be in the position for 30 seconds and you would have that amount of time to capture something of the essence of it and that was about essentially helping you shake off you know, the, the sense of not being prepared for this and get into the mindset of seeing shapes and capturing, you know, particular elements of, of a form, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I, I wonder if there is, a, you know, I, I, I guess as somebody who writes for a living, I've largely found ways of forcing that when I've absolutely yeah. had to or just sort of building it into what I do. Um, I think I struggle to see how games help, uh, might, might perform that warm up function simply because they feel like such different disciplines. Like I actually have trouble switching from playing a game to writing about a game. Right. Yeah, I don't. Like I often will play it for like if I, if I'm, I just wrote an article about Rainbow Six, for example, um, Siege. And I like, even though I was ready to write it, um, 
I find it helpful to play a game of it to have it fresh in my mind. Le- equally, I will find it helpful to have visual references to the thing I'm writing about or have the soundtrack on if I'm writing about something where that's relevant. Oh, sure. I mean, like, I, I'll often remind myself of the thing or dip back in to, to clarify something or to get, you know, to, to re-experience something that I'm then trying to put into words, right? So that that makes sense. It's not... It's not that, it's more that I often sort of need to, My, I guess my thing is that I play a thing for a while and then maybe go away and have a cup of tea and sort of try and get that thing to come into focus, right? Mm. Um, or I actually, I'm one of those people who still has a notebook because yeah. I, I hate writing directly onto a digital screen when I'm trying to get the initial shape of a thing. So I actually um, find that I will sometimes even write a whole first draft by hand Mm. um, and then have to type it all up like a loser. (laughs) Back when my, um, like, like I say, none of the games I could suggest for this are things that can't be turned into compulsions. I really struggle. Like that's the thing I'm struggling with about this question. Mm. but um i did used to find both starcraft and street fighter really helpful for this i find competitive games good warm-ups or anything really like um but that has kind of become the the occasional morning dote um which is a 45 minute commitment at least um so i love how you always refer to it as 45 minutes it's never 45 minutes well occasionally it might be just about that but like i I love how in your brain it is still that optimistic sort of the way well, that it also so, so the specific like and then i see you like an hour and a half later and you're like hello well, it does, so I'm, I'm talking specific, like you're right in the evening in the morning i would stand by that because like that this is like the 7 a.m game of dota that i do every now and then like and that is reliably a certain amount of time and it's kind of corralled into that amount of time as well simply by when it happens okay um what well, but like you know prior to that it was starcraft and starcraft was i would play three games a day but i would always play them like quite far apart from each other so and those are like 15 minute experiences usually same with rounds of street fighter and so um i found those quite helpful as kind of like because often um you know and particularly having tried to internalize the if you win, stop playing kind of mentality. It doesn't always work, particularly in any team thing where people want to keep playing. But uh that I found that helpful. Um But again, there's an element there of like self kind of – there's nothing about those games that doesn't invite you to play another. Mm. It's just that I found them quite helpful as sort of single serving focus exercises basically. Yeah. But yeah, I totally get what you're saying. Like it is ultimately about discipline – which is a shame. <laughs> so our next question is from Mike, who writes, Dear Cogs and Crankcases, since you talked about FOMO, that's fear of missing out, related to progression in multiplayer games like Vermintide 2 and Destiny. It's fear of missing out, not envy. Indeed. <laughs> um, I've been wondering how big a part that's played in the success of Plunkbat and Fortnite, where there is no progression apart from cosmetics, dubious in the case of Plunkbat. And whatever skill the player develops in the game, dubious in the case of me, Mike writes. I care because I'm about to go on a two-month camping trip, so I'll miss out on my regular plunk bat and increasingly less regular Destiny 2 sessions with my mates. That's a lot of camping. It is a lot of camping. I'm not at all, almost as much as you get in plunk bat. (laughs) Womp, womp. Is that... It was a form of joke. Oh, I see. Is that when, is the lurking kind of camping not a kind of, there's no campsite? Yeah, that is the, yeah, that is the joke. No, no, I thought I'd clarify for me. Yeah. Not for everyone else. Probably for the best. Everyone else will be at home rolling in the aisles of their houses. In the, (laughs) in the, yes. What? Anyway, Mike (laughs) continues. Um, I'm not at all concerned about missing Plunk Bat because I'm sure I will be able to jump straight back into getting shot in the head by someone I never saw without missing a beat. But either my mates will have stopped playing Destiny altogether or the coming updates will have saved the game and I'll be so far behind I'll never catch up. Do you think we're going to see the industry swing away from progression mechanics in response to the success of PUBG or have massive publishers like Activision and EA lock themselves into a model that they won't change? Cheers, Mike. So I think there are a lot of things about PUBG and Fortnite that will shake up how Activision and EA think about designing multiplayer shooters particularly. However, those companies tend to move slowly, far more slowly than, uh, that's the reason, you know, you haven't seen that yet necessarily. Um, I think this is an interesting question because obviously like 
I think the angle most people have taken is like, wow, there's been such a race for accessibility for years. Uh, not not accessibility, that's not what I mean. It, I mean, um, like sort of approachability in shooters, like immediacy. Yeah, or soft. Yeah, immediate immediate rewards, softening mm. the softening the price of failure and and um, sort of offering a kind of um, set amount of progress to everybody through XP curves and unlocks and stuff like that. And and PUBG has come along and said, nope, none of that. It's going to be a game where you walk for half an hour, get shot in the head, and do it again for some reason. Um, but I think the angle of like the fact that, I mean, because PUBG has loot crates, but they are astonishingly bad. So the fact that it almost doesn't have a progression system, it has a kind of anti-progression sock collection mini game. Um, <laughs> like is, um, like that's, that's interesting. I will be interested. Like, I suspect what will happen is the logic at a lot of studios will be, and maybe Fortnite already has some science of this, like, well, do you know what would make this bigger? XP bars and hats. Mm. You know what I mean? It feels like someone's just yet to make the the PUBG way you level up. Maybe that it does exist. It sounds pop. <laughs> the thing is, though, I mean, uh, this is stuff that has been included in games for a chunk of time. So it's... I used to play quite a lot of gun game right in mm. counter-strike and but that was entirely because of spending time with friends and it wasn't you know a thing where i felt like i had any progression outside of that yeah game right you'd try and earn a kill with one weapon and then you know progress to the next one but it would all get reset once everyone was done and you know i didn't feel like i was being you know uh match made in any meaningful way um so you know there are elements of that which are which i th- i would assume people have known are popular for a chunk of time mm. i guess what will be interesting to see is whether those things are popular in other settings and perhaps also without that critical mass of players that that these big games do have you know whether um whether that type of lack of progression i guess is something that that can be adapted for you know, other game types or smaller audiences or different, you know, uh, types of play. And also it, it would need to be demonstrably, um, more financially efficient, right? Than, than the things that currently exist because, you know, um, it, that, that's ultimately what's going to, be the best way of changing a company like Activision's mind, right? Is, is demonstrably this thing being more effective at getting people to invest their dollars in your game and their time in your game and share it with friends than, you know, than a thing that lets them tick a number up that might be meaningful to them in some way. So to some extent, this has already happened thinking about it. So. In Activision's case, the best example is Overwatch, mm. um, which doesn't have power progression in that sense. You do level up, you do get loot crates. There is a reason to play beyond that, and obviously people take their crates and their cosmetics seriously. Um, but I think, so, you know, the particular uh, fear of missing out that Mike was describing was to do with, like, falling behind in power curves, as you can do in a lot of games. Uh, Destiny is obviously its own thing. I don't think MMOs are going to ditch leveling up in that way. But... um so, you know, so Overwatch is an older example, but, uh, Battlefront 2, which is obviously a recent game and highly surrounded by controversy when it comes to its progression systems and unlocks and things, um, recently had a big patch that has basically completely stripped out any form of power progress, progress, <laughs> power progression mm. from crates and leveling up and put it all in, uh, and put and put and basically re-geared the as far as I can tell the entire um, 
sort of re-geared the progression system and unlock system towards cosmetics mm. in step with other games. That's, that's EA ticked off the list. And then uh, the other thing maybe to draw attention to that I noticed recently is uh, Rainbow Six Siege has done the same thing. Suddenly, you don't have to unlock weapon attachments anymore. You get them all. Mm. Um, and it, that game has recalibrated its entire offering towards a, a cosmetic unlock system. Not quite because you still have to unlock operatives, uh, which is... Oh, yeah. But it's not quite like you get the operative and then you have to continue leveling the operative up to get access to all their stuff. Yeah. You know, so it's not 100% changed, but it's softened. It's a softening of... Um, of that curve. So I would say that actually, I don't think this has anything to do with um, PUBG specifically. I think it has to do with changing trends more broadly, but I actually think maybe those kinds of leveling up systems are on their way out. It's interesting though, because I, I don't know whether I've maybe slightly misunderstood the thrust of the question. Um, is it so, yeah, I don't think I've entirely understood. So the question it. is, is the success of games like PUBG that don't have any of the kind of traditional retention mechanics like account leveling or, right. um, you know, PUBG is an extreme example because it doesn't have ranks. Actually, no, it does. It does have leaderboards, but they're so kind of massive that I think maybe it's only going to be a relevant progression system for a handful of extremely good players, really. Mm. Um, it doesn't have like, uh, any of the kind of traditional sort of multiplayer retention things like I'm a level 15 shooty man now, or I am rank bronze five, or I, you know, or I have prestiged this many times or whatever. It just got achievements, but like it is curiously short on that sort of thing for a game as big as it is. But I mean, in terms of what was actually asked, there was like, I I feel like it touches on the sensation of, being left behind in some way or sort of um your friends having moved on if you take a break from a thing right so that's an aspect of it yeah and so what i'm kind of uh, wanted to maybe mention in relation to that is that there they are very different types of pressure where you know because the perhaps the destiny one or if you play a different game that version of it is that if you are away for x number of gaming evenings you are then under leveled and not part of the group in the same way right so there's a pressure to keep playing to not go away to to not miss out on mm, that that's true. leveling yeah. but then in terms of something like PUBG there's the fear the the real fear that if those progression mechanics are also not there to necessarily hook your friends in over a long period of time it might be that if you go away for just long enough you miss the entire bubble of it and when yeah. you go back your mates are all we're on to this thing now and you're like, oh, I thought we were still playing this thing that I haven't exhausted for myself yet. Yeah, that actually, that thought occurred to me as well. Like, part of this is sort of maybe, like, whether or not these games actually do stick. They're so big now, I can't see them not sticking. Some of them are, but some of them might, you know, have that thing where, you know, people get into them for a while, but then when the when the critical mass stops... It, I mean, this is a very, very, very different example, but I remember when I was playing Wildstar, and I was playing it with quite a few other people that I knew because we were all, you know, playing it for various work-related reasons, and I was really enjoying it. But because everybody stopped once we'd finished, my experience was suddenly, I have no friends to play this with anymore. And that was such a kind of big part of the enjoyment of doing yeah. the activities within the game that it instantly, like, even though I'd envisioned myself continuing on with it, that had factored in the social element that suddenly disappeared. And that was very odd. Yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting thing, because I think a lot of the time, traditional kind of RPG style progression mechanics serve to keep people playing, even if, like, friends move on, because, like people want to keep leveling up and stuff maybe PUBG is slightly vulnerable to like if you know if if enough people's specific play groups all move on at the same time maybe it could lose a big chunk of its player base mm. i wonder if maybe dota has a similar thing but i don't know if like that's big enough to put an internet on mass given how vast it is now but i don't yeah. think it would affect necessarily PUBG or fortnite or something but if and it might or it might not as a whole but perhaps like a little local gaming group could entirely fall out of it if key members just don't yeah 
don't want to keep playing and then the rest of the group fractures because they happened to be the the nexus for some of those friendship connections right like yeah. you didn't have that other person on steam or you know they're a friend of a friend but not someone that you feel comfy saying hey do you want to play or mm. you know that kind of thing so i think that it <laughs> Obviously, this this has run the risk of taking the question away from what it was intended to be, but it, that struck me as an element that there's that there's two different types of pressure mm. and sort of social dynamic at play that could kick in after you'd been away for two months. Yeah, yeah, I think that's reasonable. Hmm. Our next question comes from Rick, who writes: "Hi, loaf and bread knife." I got bored of building and maintaining PCs years ago and got a Mac. Now they're the only computers I own and my primary gaming devices. I got a 27-inch iMac last year and I haven't felt the need to put Windows on it yet. 95% of the games I want to play are cross-platform anyway. And I know that I'm so lazy that if I have to restart my computer, I'll just play something else instead. That was the real boss that made me quit Dark Souls. However, if I were to put a boot camp partition on my lovely computer, which flavor of Windows would ruin it the least? Warmest regards, uh, Rick. Yeah, a telling ellipsis looking at this code. So Windows 7 is probably the answer to this, but God knows if that's even easy to hold on to this year as Windows 10 starts to rest itself into being. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is, like, in terms of... I don't know how much of this is obviously, like, self-serving Windows rhetoric, but, you know, those things will stop being supported and therefore yeah. do become perhaps... Vul- well do become vulnerable over time right if you um yes i mean i i like we're not necessarily the the first place you'd go to for windows tech support don't install windows 8 try not to install windows 10 (laughs) yeah yeah i think i think it depends what you want to play like if you want to like if you can find a copy of windows 7 and try and convince it not to try and turn into windows 10 then that's probably the best the thing is, I have on every device that I have to use regularly, I use Windows 10 and largely it has been okay. It's just that it's intrusive and not built. I, I My big objection is the fact that it wants to restart for, uh, you know, it doesn't take into account how I actually use my computer and yeah. and and uh, not just in the terms of installing updates and restarting and things it 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 my massive objection to it and the reason that i keep just being unable to have anything other than an adversarial relationship with it is that it so clearly exists to fulfill microsoft's intentions and not mine yeah it's an operating system pretending to be a web 2.0 sort of horror escape um which is yeah i mean yeah i, I was kind of uh, actually astonished by how because uh, um that, so something again we haven't mentioned and will presumably come up on the pod at some point uh is sea of thieves which windows 10 exclusive yeah it? windows 10 exclusive came out last week uh this week um i thought you know that i mean obviously you have some pc issues at the moment not related to windows 10 um but like you know certainly preventing you from playing sea of thieves mm. with me it was a Windows 10 thing that wouldn't install that finally caused me to try and fix it, which has now resulted in it absolutely yeah. falling over. In defense of Windows 10, when we got to the bottom of that, it wasn't Windows's fault because no, you had a physical it, hard drive. So, but that leads me back around to the non-user-friendly side of things, which is yeah. that Windows 10 itself and the way that it was handling whether it could or couldn't do things <laughs> yeah. was not offering me, the end user, any useful information in terms of, you know, how to fix, how to narrow down, how to, um, you yeah, know, that's like true. even approach what this it was. It was trying to be your pal about an update it was struggling to install, ignoring the fact that the reason it was struggling to install an update was because of a hard drive error and eventually just, and it just would never tell me even yeah. anything about that but when it blue screens it does do a sad face a sad emoticon face so exactly because it's trying to be a friend um but yeah i was, I was genuinely like because i did sort of click, like maybe maybe this is maybe this is the sea of thieves episode i thought maybe you'll play this and i think it'd be a fun thing for you and i to play together mm. um but then i uh, had the incredible experience of going to buy it, which involved, and this is maybe, <laughs> <It's the worst. laughs> 
<laughs> which <laughs> involved a store page. So I had to log into my Xbox Live account, which I basically never want to do. And then I had to... Fun fact, I have three of those because a Games for Windows Live error means that I now can't access my actual account but have two shell accounts that it's set up on my behalf <laughs> for no good reason. Um, and, <laughs> um, and yes, and then I went to the store page, um, which was kind to inform me of all my friends who've bought the game, but told me the game did not exist. <laughs> Uh, until I clicked, uh, it, what it did was this game is not available. However, it is part of this bundle and the bundle was just also Sea of Thieves. <laughs> so it's on the store page for Sea of Thieves, but Sea of Thieves, the, the, the unavailable game is available in a bundle titled Sea of Thieves. So I clicked that and that took me through to an identical page where oh, the game yeah. was available I for think 50 to- pounds. <sighs> Oh, <laughs> I had to do something really convoluted to get it to preload. I remember that. And I still haven't played it. Um, but the only thing I would say is that every time I think that Windows 10 has angered me more than it is possible to be angered by anything, I open my laptop and remember that's Windows 8. <laughs> yeah, I think... So Windows 8 is an objectively a worse operating system, but at the same time, it lacks... It's really into squares. It loves squares. <laughs> Squares with a big thing. Squares with a new this list. This is Instagram's legacy. Yeah. It was Windows 8. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, at least it, um, at least it isn't trying to be a Facebook in the way that Windows 10 sometimes feels like it is. That's the only thing I'll say in favor of Windows 8. Basically, in answer to the question, Windows 7, probably, but unless you want to play Sea of Thieves, in which case, <sighs> Windows infinity sign. It's weird because, like, I, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm uh, grudging against Microsoft more than any other big corporation that wants my data, right? It's, it, it, it's more just that because I have to use that every day, it's, it's one that repeatedly gets in my face with it. Whereas I can choose to not be involved with Facebook or, you know, Twitter, if I want to, mm. to leave those, right. But the nature of my work means that I have to work out how to make the creator's update actually work and appear yeah. and not keep resetting my PC for, for reasons that weren't its fault, but that it wouldn't tell me about. <laughs> so a final question, and it is a very good question, comes from Discord hero Veer Serif, nice. who has written us a, Uh, I believe Discord found out last week that we had seen Hamilton. Hamilton! Yep. (laughs) (laughs) You're welcome! That's Moana. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And Shiny! That's also Moana. (laughs) And uh, she writes, uh, she's not only written us a question, uh, she has written the question uh, set to the tune of uh, Dear Theodosia from Hamilton. My blank face should tell you everything about what I remember from a week ago. So, <laughs> dare I attempt to actually sing this, or shall I just read it out? Which do you feel up to, you as a human person? Well, I can only... emotional wants and needs. <laughs> I'm being supportive. I'm going to attempt to rise to this challenge. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, indeed. And I apologise... If the if the following section of podcast is just a one beep. Do you want me to help? Hamilton! That does help. <laughs> <laughs> Although you're setting the entertainment level bar rather high for what's about to happen, Pip. Oh, but nonetheless, Fear has done such a good job of writing this to this tune that I'm going to butcher that tune now. Do you want me to look away? No, that's not how that works. Okay. <laughs> See, it's a hearing thing. Sweetie. No, but I thought, you know, if you felt self-conscious, me staring directly at you might, you know... <laughs> I don't, no, that's okay. It's not a matter of self-consciousness. It might be like when it's people more a matter of actual humanitarian concern. Okay. You know, luckily this is the last question of the episode. So if people are feeling vicariously uh, mortified, then they can just, you know, <laughs> join us next week. <laughs> anyway, this Seraph writes, Dear Craden Crowbar, what to say to you? I have no puns, but I have this little space. When you opened up for questions, I tried. This is my attempt. Sorry, I'm not sure how well it scans. 
I want to know which games you all believe would do the best when put onto a stage and with song transcend their genre bounds. Become a musical. I got that one wrong. If it came to pass, what would it be like? Would it be overblown or be a niche gemstone, episodic open world and much more? How would it all translate? And what could be its tone? Would it blow us all away? Some day, some day, would it blow us all away? That's from Veer Serif. So Veer did also add a uh, short no singing version of this question, uh, which is helpful to know in hindsight, which was which games or game series do you think could turn into a halfway decent musical? So if that didn't scan, then yes. So games to musicals, Pip. I genuinely don't know. Uh, and that might just be because I don't play many actual sort of long form story games that would have enough meat to do that with. And it's par- partly also, I assume, because I don't hear music. I, <laughs> as in the thing that I just did before you did an actual decent amount of singing. <clears throat> The noises that came from my face. Did you I fully... remember that as a song from Hamilton? I mean, I would actually not forgive you for not recognising it as a song not from Hamilton. But... <laughs> Rude. Um, no, I, mean, no, yeah, I like... genuinely do not recall ever having heard that song before. That's fair, but it was... Well, no, actually, that's, it's interesting. But... I, I, And that's not a reflection on you as a singer. That's... I wouldn't recognise a single song from Hamilton reliably at all it was a week ago i know over a week ago eight days (laughs) Hmm. i've got no chance (laughs) there was a girl who was walking down the street outside sainsbury's the other day and she had a hamilton t-shirt uh hoodie rather and i recognized that reliably and then i went to sort of give her some sort of signal that i another person who had seen or was presumably familiar with hamilton appreciated this and had noticed it and then but all i could think of was hamilton (laughs) and that's not that's just a hoot that's that's some honking that i'm doing right there um well how did you i know the answer to this but i'm gonna make you say uh how did you describe the musical you went to see to your colleagues when they asked how it was oh i forgot what it was called and i just said you know that musical about alexander hamilton (laughs) rent <laughs> and also i get weird things like i do get bits of it stuck in my head but never the right lyrics so there's there's definitely a version of a song which is i'm not throwing away my socks <laughs> um, <laughs> which is now my laundry song <laughs> and i can't reliably be called upon to actually remember whether that's the real so, lyrics or not <laughs> yeah um yeah it's an amazing bit of foreshadowing for when alexander hamilton's fate revolves around a a sock incident yeah (laughs) yeah but so i mean and that i think a bit to go back to veer's question Mm. it's i genuinely cannot think musically in terms of anything and so i can appreciate that perhaps a an epic with a beginning and a middle and an end for example mass effect i guess might be might lend itself to that but See, like, i can't I, I feel so much the opposite of this because everything <laughs> for me like obviously ability to perform musical theater and understanding this is uh as in lack of this is like everything every game it'd be vastly improved by being a musical there's so many so many so many uh, edge of it and particularly because like so much like early game storytelling is so over the top and so much early game acting is so campy in some ways or so overblown that actually games, a lot of, a lot of games are on the cusp of either being porn or musicals by which I mean, or actually, well, what they are is action movies where like the, the speak, like the thing those things have in common is the stalking bits is a prelude to some form of action and in a musical which is the thing we're talking about not the other two Mm. that thing is a big song and dance number like how much better would command and conquer be if those cheesy fmv cutscenes gave way to big all together now type brotherhood of nod dance alongs like how much better would that be are you thinking of tim curry's 
uh, previous I'm thinking about the entire relevant. lot. Yeah, like Tim Curry. Like, yeah, perfect. Everyone's <laughs> everyone's having more fun when that happens. Um, like, because the obvious choice is like The Witcher would make for a fabulous musical and it would actually disarm some of The Witcher's more sort of regressive traits, I think, to have it be a, a kind of self-aware um, sort of um, romp, you know? Mm. Uh, Mass Effect's an obvious choice. I think Dragon Age is actually more of a kind of uh maybe more of a panto we've had this conversation about panto before but sort of waiting to happen mm. um and then you'd never go and see it because you hate panto i don't hate panto <laughs> i don't hate panto <laughs> Well, I, I, if I say that enough, I have a distinct memory of certain people refusing to see certain other people's pantomime of choice and not being in any way excited that Cliff Parisi, formerly of EastEnders, was going to be starring in said pantomime. I think that's a reasonable memory to have. I think you and I get different things out of the theatre. You get Cliff, Cliff Parisi and... You see, I remember this grudge as if it were yesterday. It was four years ago. And yet... An eight days ago event. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, nonetheless, uh, yeah, I, I've always wanted, like, so obviously the question was games that would make good musicals, and I guess the answer of all of them is not quite acceptable. Um, let's think. Is there any, any other specific ones? I think... I think StarCraft would... Yeah. Yes. Yeah, all of Blizzard's stuff would probably be better as a musical because, again, big, dumb cutscenes. And it would be shorter, presumably. <laughs> well, some of those things go on forever, musicals, I mean. Really? Yeah. But they wouldn't be allowed to be, They'd like, be... more than a week long, well, right? Well, what, what we need to... <laughs> like, need to Warcraft argue. would all, struggle. <laughs> all games should give you a break in the middle where someone will sell you a little ice cream. Who's that guy in the pants? Thrall? The, the one who's not prepared. <laughs> Illidan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, perfect. We're right. You are not prepared is a complete Disney, like, call and response on the way in, right? You know what I mean? Like, he's not prepared. You know, basically... I was thinking more along the lines of let it go. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, let, let it go m maps onto so many different, like, video game kind of fantasy scenarios, mm. right? There's, there, are, there are a whole bunch of different video game drama moments where that song fits mm. um like more or less i mean like i actually sing that where every other time i do a crystal maiden alt yes but i think that says more about you i think that's it not invites about it your, that's not about dota being good for a musical though that's just about the fact that you you love to to have a moment <laughs> <laughs> yeah fair all right fine I do, I would love, I'd love someone, in, in terms of like games, I'd love someone to make a musical game. Like, I'd like, I really would like, I know that the question was making musicals out of video game subject matter, but I really just want games to have songs in them. Portal is pretty much a musical. Even if you only got one song. Crypt of the Necro Dancer. Yeah, yeah. That's got, you know, moves to a rhythm. And like, I know that it's, Obviously, it's not perfect, but Dominique Pamplemousse had a sort yeah. of an interesting... It is a explicitly Brecht as its influence. As a, I believe there's a, a sequel also indeed. at this point. Um, and um, actually, uh, Saints Row 4, I know I mention it all the time when it comes to things I love that are theatrical, but that has a really fun relationship with music. Mm. Uh, it uses uh, licensed music really well. Um, and it actually has a lovely... I've forgotten the song they sing, but there's a lovely like little bit of actual genuine sort of heart warming character development which is just a bunch of characters singing in a car you know the gta thing if you're driving to the mission and everyone's talking yeah. in the car they just all start singing in the car which is like something that Aww. actual friends do but like video game characters are normally like too cinematically written by hauser brothers to do mm. um so that was nice i liked that yeah um i know that's not the question either but you know i think it's it it does feel like games only rarely get further than a very basic sort of scored approach to music and that's not to to undermine the 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 very amazing work that goes into scoring things or into you know licensing music for particular moments and things it's more about the fact that maybe it's just it, it it's genuinely difficult thing to to do yeah. or to, you know, to experiment with and also a very expensive thing to, 
do and to experiment with. And so, you know, you, the only things that you really have that, that go in that direction are things like rhythm action games, because that is not exactly a tried and tested thing. It's, it's, what I mean is it's, it's more a, um, a, a known quantity. It's not a, a risk in the same way as, you know, perhaps a musical would be. It might well, you know, that it, it's, an acquired taste, I think it might yeah. put people off. It's, you know, I, I don't, uh, without precedent and without massively financially successful precedent in gaming, maybe it's just a thing that, that studios maybe struggle to. There's a, there's a, there's a design concern as well, which is musicals uh, inherently, uh, sort of like um, the vast majority, like musicals don't have a tremendous amount of agency. Like characters in musicals don't like the, the kind of the, the the great kind of strange conceit of a musical is they're all set in a world where um like music can just sort of take over people's brains and compel them to do choreographed dance routines that they weren't expecting to be you know to yeah. do it, it it draws in people from the sidelines i think the only way for it to work in a video game is for the player to be leading mm. it used to be a thing you could do um this is maybe the most me story i'll ever tell but we used to do this thing uh when uh, i was we were young and unbearable and theatery kids in the Edinburgh Fringe where you could go to basically any dance floor and if you positioned yourselves in a diamond around the dance floor with all of you facing in the same direction so one person would be at the tip of the diamond you could really easily mimic each other and create the sense of um, an entire dance floor of people performing a choreographed dance routine when it was actually improvised but following a single person mm. and the amazing thing about this is if you could set it up right you could get the entire you could get strangers doing it. Mm. As soon as people start to twig what was going on, people start joining in. And then, you know, when it goes perfectly, you end up with an entire, the thing, the best thing is always the expression on the face of the DJ at whatever club you're in. Yeah. Because suddenly the entire crowd, almost like a flash mob, but literally yeah. nobody's leading. Well, one, only one person's leading, but it looks like everybody learned this in advance. So a video game that could kind of smartly follow the actions of a player who's in the lead and kind of drop in side backing dances around yeah. them. Um, that would be great. I don't know what end to what end other than. <laughs> well, I think fabulousness, but obviously yeah. rhythm plays a significant part part in games, and as do sort of sound cues and things. So it's more just sort of that. I guess they haven't yet resolved often into the other formats for for that that we use music and entertainment in in other areas right mm. um but i you know i appreciate that it because gaming is a very difficult sort of um technical undertaking in in some very specific ways and so if you if you think that writing a branching narrative is hard writing a uh you know a musical branching narrative would be absolutely it, 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 the biggest undertaking and something that someone would probably regret and burn out on. Yeah, and throw that's probably into the, the sea. that's the white whale I I so, would chase through Game Maker. <laughs> there are things that sort of do a version of it. So, for example, I think um, Child of Light is rhyming couplets, or it's um, it, it it has a particular regular verse form, and I'm I can't remember whether the game has like a branching thing. I think you just follow a, a yeah. story, right? But um it it has a certain you know there's a rhythm to it and the speech is done with particular rhythms and cadences and um things in mind and also to actually express something about the characters at points yeah i believe so you know it's it, that stuff does exist but it's kind of interesting that oh it, yeah it's but to go back to the original question i think that yeah, I guess I would just say that any over the top sort of story, especially like a space opera like Starcraft, would mm. lend itself. Monkey and, Island. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. The yeah. Um, actually, look, most of the old LucasArts adventure games. Simon Max would be a great musical. Mm. Simon Max, the kind of Simon the Sorcerer. Well, it's basically Blues Brothers at that point. Simon the Sorcerer would be a good. One. Yeah. Yeah. But basically, what I'm looping around to is every game would be better <laughs> as a musical. Anyway. I mean, I wouldn't know what had just happened at all, mm. ever. 
because <laughs> I can't reliably. So added to the fact that I can't reliably remember events from a week ago, I can't remember tunes that I hear, you know, the about five seconds ago. I really can't. And that's, and I'm not just sort of saying that in a theatrical over the top, lol, my memory way, but it's, I, I don't know if it's a, you know, if it, if it verges into that sort of the, the medical kind of a, whatever it is, um, uh, Atonality kind of, I don't know if that's a word. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Like, yeah, it, I, I don't, I don't think it's quite as severe as that. It's, but if, um, cause Lumino City, which is a beautiful game, um, to yeah. sort of handcrafted, like model world that you're exploring to find, I think it's your grandfather. Um, there's a music puzzle in that that I just couldn't do. Right. <laughs> and I eventually I just had to write down the things like to to follow because it required you to remember a tune and play it back. And in the 20 seconds that it took for it to have finished the tune and for me to try and be remembering parts of it, couldn't do it. I actually couldn't do it. I had to actually write down physically where the notes were right. in relation to each other on a piece of paper and then just go through it step by step like that. I... <laughs> <laughs> It's hard. <laughs> but you did enjoy Hamilton, right? Your inability to... Oh, I had a wonderful time. I cried, I laughed, I clapped. Yeah, I just wanted to, I just wanted to you know, return yeah. to that because obviously... But because Lin-Manuel Lin Miranda's sort of um, signature is on both of them and I've seen Moana far more, mm. I have now absolutely conflated any songs from Hamilton with Moana and my inability to remember key and tone reliably means that I'm not getting those right reliably <laughs> either. So Chris would just sometimes walk into a room and I'll just cheerfully say, I am Hamilton! <laughs> and that's not quite the right notes. I know it's not. I can't remember them. <laughs> I can't reproduce them. But... <laughs> <laughs> Good. At least I will never, ever sort of, yeah, um, steal any of your song works. <laughs> my, my what? I don't know. If you ever decided to become a composer of like a hip hop song, I would you would never have to worry about me selling it to anybody because I wouldn't be able to. I would definitely it. need to become a musician at some point for that to occur. So I think that was a danger. <laughs> but you know what? Do you know I who mean? can sing? Pardon? I'm going to put him on the spot here. Do you know who can sing? Is it Tom Senior? It is Tom Senior. Very talented He's musician. He's very musical. He is very musical. I don't understand any of that. He has whole musical instruments that I would look at and go, mm. <laughs> <laughs> He plays violin, doesn't he? Uh, I think he plays pretty much everything. And the drums. I, I, so I've known him to play drums, violin, guitar, and keyboard piano, I think. Is it that thing where it's kind of like languages like once you get past a certain point you're basically just all languages are fine that's not a thing but i have noticed that friends who so, know two languages can pick up a third right yeah sorry i thought you we were arguing there's like a kind of critical matter it's like after that you know all of them no it's, i'm not <laughs> arguing that it's like you know the the ear fish thing yeah the babel, babel fish thing. thing yes yeah good good yeah it's, this is no ear fish but um, I would say that I, yeah, I had a friend like that. He, he could just, he was like grade eight in like everything from the piano to the euphonium. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and I'm just kind of like, how are these things even related? They're not. It turned out he was just good at music. <laughs> imagine, imagine, imagine. I never passed grade one of the French horn. <laughs> God, the thought of you with a horn. It was really big as well. It's a really unwieldy instrument and I had to sort of hold it and, and I, I couldn't reliably reproduce Merrily We Roll Along. <laughs> There's three notes. I couldn't do it. I can't imagine you having any more fun than getting to ineptly play a horn. It's very loud. It was great. I played it out of spite. <laughs> God. My parents demanded that I learn a musical oh. instrument and I called their bluff and I said, well, the French horn, assuming that that would be the point <laughs> at which the bluff was called. It was not. There was a year of this. If nothing else, I'm glad this question led us to the concept of your spite horn. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, good. That is all of the questions we have time for, I'm afraid. If you'd like to send us a question for a future episode, you can do so by emailing us the questions at creatingcrowbar.com. You can also find us on YouTube at creatingcrowbar.com forward slash, no, shut up, Chris, youtube.com forward slash creatingcrowbar. You can hang out with the Discord community. Link for that is on creatingcrowbar.com, the thing I almost said earlier. Mm. And as ever, this episode is supported by our Patreon. Thank you to all our Patreon backers. You, what did you just do? There's did you, something in my hair. Did you just break your hair? No, there's Oh, my God. Nothing. Yeah, there is. What? Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. What is it? It's, I can't... You, it's, Okay. It's a. Uh, oh, ow! Is it sticky tape? Yeah. How did I don't know? Was that? Is that? Has that been there all day? <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm <laughs> glad you're getting all of this on tape. <laughs> Thanks to our Patreon backers who are asked to produce quality entertainment of this caliber. <laughs> Uh, your ongoing contributions can be, uh, renewed, restored, or cancelled at <laughs> patreon.com forward slash great and crowbar. Um, uh, yeah, uh, as ever, that thank won't you help. for listening. And, um, I mean, I won't not have nonsense stuck to me <laughs> if people cancel their subscriptions. You can get rid of that idea right now. <laughs> okay. Um, we won't make that promise, nor can we promise that more things will get stuck to Pip if you pledge more. Yeah, I'm not um, a magnet. <laughs> Not a magnet. <laughs> uh, I'm not a magnet. I'm just blowing this horn out of spite. Yeah. Um, if you would like to follow Pip on Twitter, how can they do that? Well, <laughs> it's just follow Philippa. the sound of the horn. <laughs> it's at Philippa War, which is P H I L I P P A W A double R. Although I will really understand if you'd prefer to unfollow <laughs> at this point. <laughs> And you can unfollow me on Twitter at C Thurston, <laughs> that's C-T-H-U-R-S-T-E-N. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks, for, Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs>